Welcome to another episode of InRange. In front of me on the table is a World War II era Gewehr 43. And I see a thing that goes on in the firearms community. What I mean by that are people that are interested in the topic. <clears throat> and it seems that the more rare or esoteric the gun is, the more magical attributes are associated with it. And in some regards, people that write books and magazines have contributed to that. And while about 400,000 of these were made during the war, let's contrast that to the M1 Garand, the American semi-automatic equivalent, which was issued to almost every soldier in the field in which they made 5.4 million. So a very huge discrepancy of numbers there. But at the same time, we can attribute some of that to, of course, the German wartime economy and manufacturing capabilities when they were quite legitimately and literally being bombed into oblivion. The early attempts to create a semi-automatic rifle had strange constraints placed upon them, like, for example, no drilling of a gas port, which culminated in the G41, the Gewehr 41, which had the old bang system on it, in which gas was captured in front of the muzzle, not in the barrel, and then funneled back into the gas system. And a significant number of those were issued. But the reality was some of these requirements uh, that were put upon and imposed upon the designers modified their designs in a way that were absolutely suboptimal. And after the G41 was fielded for not a very long duration of time, it was very clear that some of those restrictions were stupid. And they literally stole the gas system, the short stroke piston gas system from the Soviet SVT-40 and realized what if we make the G41 into a more capable version, which culminated in the G43 K43. And the guns actually share a lot of commonality, including, in fact, the ability to change out parts from one for the other. You can use a G41 dust cover on a G43. You can use, even with, if you want to avoid, have some issues with using stripper clips, you can even use the, uh, the, the bolt carrier. You can even use the bolt and the flappers, which we'll get into more later. But they put in the short stroke gas system here and added a detachable 10 round magazine. We have an optic rail here. And otherwise, it is almost part for part interchangeable with the original G41. However, that modified and improved gas system and the interchangeable magazines and some of those improvements did make the gun more capable. And that is why many more of the G43 was created than the G41. And as I mentioned earlier in this video, the World War II German manufacturing capability was greatly restricted, not only economically, but due to the fact that their factories were being bombed into oblivion, entire cities were on fire. Um, so certain shortcuts had to be made that they took from going from the G41 to the G43. And some of those shortcuts culminated in some problems with the G43. But really what I wanna to talk to you about today in this video is that it doesn't matter if they had taken those shortcuts or not, this design and this rifle design is actually a flawed design right from the get-go and was never really a good rifle. So let's talk about some of the shortcuts that had to be made going from the G41 to the 43 due to just resource restrictions and manufacturing capabilities. The original G41 had a milled dust cover here, this component right here, which is also the carrier for the bolt carrier, I should say the slide and the external surfaces that guide the bolt carrier through the cycling process. It also has the, the uh, recoil spring within it. And when they went from the G41 milled, they went to a stamped sheet metal equivalent, which is what's on this gun right now. And their heat treatment, quality of materials, but also the idea of this being stamped sheet metal, regardless of that, was deeply flawed. And almost every G43 you'll see now, partially because of the gas system, another component that's to be discussed, has cracks in the rear of it. And those cracks will continue to develop until the gun will become literally unsafe to fire and this entire system will fly off and possibly into the shooter's face during the firing cycle. Now, some of that was exacerbated by the fact that they very much overgassed this system. They wanted it to be reliable in any environment with their base ammunition. And uh, that meant the recoil was significant and uh, far more severe than it needed to be but also means that it had a very short lifespan. You overgas the gun coupled with poor heat treatment and poor ma material quality, and you have a gun that only lasts for a short duration of time. However, when you're losing men on the Eastern Front in the thousands per minute, uh, along with their equipment, you really don't care about the lifespan of a rifle. 
So if you are interested in shooting a G43 today, there are some things you can do. You can add an aftermarket gas system that diminishes the amount of gas being put into the system. And you can use lower recoiling ammunition to help mitigate some of that. But the reality is I've done all that and I have gone through at least two of these stamped sheet metal covers where I felt that they were no longer safe to use after firing for not a very long duration of time, even with a properly gassed gun. So this going from milled to stamped sheet metal was just a very bad idea. The general design of the rifle has some other inherent problems regardless of quality of materials. And I'm gonna show you that right now. So the takedown of this gun is very interesting. On the earlier models, you pull the bolt carrier back you can lock it into a recess like this, which then keeps it locked back. That is not kept locked back by the magazine. That is kept locked back by my locking that little lever right there. This now is how you field strip the gun. You push a button in the rear, pull it forward, and this entire unit comes out as a single unit. This is now a spring-loaded grenade. If I accidentally trip this button, these parts go flying everywhere, and you will inevitably lose parts. Later in the war, they even omitted this little clip and you had to just do it manually by hand. But when I zoom in here in a moment and show you how you field strip this rifle and how the locking recessors work, which is flapper locked, you're going to see that this is a deeply flawed design. So we have the locked back bolt assembly here and I'm going to push down and release that clip and carefully pull it apart. At this point, the bolt carrier comes off, goes to the side, and this is your bolt and your recoil spring assembly can stay within the guide, although the spring comes loose. And without being careful, that falls out as well. So these are parts you can now lose, as well as, as I said, this area here is what generally fractures uh, from overuse. In fact, there's a crack in this one right there. Anyways, let me talk more about how the gun works. This is the bolt, and these are the locking, these are the locking lugs of the bolt. It is in many ways a precursor to the delayed roller and locked roller, which became a much better design. But these are flapping, flaps, and they have flat surfaces in the rear. And as the wedge comes back, those flaps open and close. So as the bolt goes into battery, the spring pushes the wedge forward, and these flaps go out into the locking recesses in the side of the receiver. The reality is, though, you really don't know if you're getting locked on both sides or only one side of the flap. These things can get put out of order, can be mixed up with guns, and the you might only be locking on one side of this bolt carrier, even though both locking lugs are technically there and present, meaning you have a dangerous situation, in which if that shears off, this is going to fire essentially without being locked whatsoever with full power eight millimeter. But let's go ahead and say that's working properly and you're field stripping this to clean it in the field. So you pull out your wedge and then watch this. Those fall out. These are the locking wedges, flaps, for your gun. Can you imagine losing one of these in the field or in the mud or in the snow or in the wherever you're at? Interestingly, and at least they did this, they put a little divot right here on the bolt to remind you that the right side goes with this side. So you lock, you match up those little rivets or divots. You see what just happened? This is actually also very hard to put back together. So you gotta have to put that wedge in and you have to put this wedge in. Hopefully they don't fall out, hold them in, then push the wedge back in while wiggling it without uh, wiggling it. Boom, okay, we are now back together. That is how you put the bolt back together. Remember, you have to do this all the time because you're firing corrosive ammunition. If you don't clean this, this gun is not gonna work for very long. So once your bolt is back together, and you didn't lose your locking lugs. You gotta put this spring back in, which is half of the recoil spring assembly. Put this spring back on top of it. Well, actually it's easier to put the spring into the bolt. Then you have to fit the bolt carrier into the top. Then you've gotta fit this over that and make sure the dust cover fits underneath it. I messed it up, hold on. There we go. Make sure this dust cover fits underneath it, like that. Then you have to pull it back under pressure. Don't let it go, because it'll explode. Push this back in, and you've now got your little spring-loaded bolt carrier hand grenade back together. Now, to put that back in the gun, you have to line it up, 
push that spring in, and then it should go down into the receiver. At that point, once you release this latch, it will go forward. And you are now back together. However, keep in mind, all that's keeping this together and held together are some little lugs right here and here. And as this fractures and it recoils too severely, this can fly off into your face. One of the first indications of that getting close to happen, being close to happening, is when your safety, which is this, literally just flies out while you're shooting. This is held in only with a C-clip, and as the gun's recoiling very hard, your safety can actually go plink and just fall out. Okay, one thing that was cool, at least to some degree, was the 10-round magazine. Detachable, interchangeable magazines. Any G43 magazine will go into any other G43 and work. That's nice. That's not the case with the SVT-40 from Soviet Russia. And when they first issued these guns, they issued one with the gun and two in a pouch. So you had 30 rounds that you would just take out the mag, put a new one in. Only 30. Once you had depleted all three of your magazines, you were back to strip of clips. I'll show you that in a minute. However, as the war went on, they couldn't manufacture enough magazines, and you were lucky to have even one magazine, meaning you had 10 rounds plus strip of clips. At any rate, once you're down to your last magazine and it locks back, you then have to guide this into these little divots and do the old strip of clip thing. Not terrible, not terrible. But when you compare that to what the M1 Garin did with M block clips, this is much, much slower. Okay, so let's talk about the gas system. Once you pull the nose cap off, don't lose this piece of wood. You might need this later. And don't let this fall out, because you need that later. But I do have an aftermarket gas system on here that diminishes the amount of gas getting into the system. However, the, op the gas, the actual piston itself, or I should say the op rod, is still metallurgically problematic. Without this being treated properly and being of a hard enough material, this starts mushrooming out at the front of the receiver and eventually becomes a problem. So while the gas system was copied from the SVT-40, the actual design of it wasn't optimal in principle. So when you pull this out, there is actually a middle transfer rod. Don't lose that in the field. Then the actual op rod comes off, and then this comes off the piston. All right, so three more parts that you could easily lose while you need to field strip and field clean this in probably not very optimal environments. Put the cup back on, put this op rod back in, then the transfer rod assembly between. At that point, you can put your wooden handguard back on. Hopefully you haven't lost your spring clip. And there you go, back in action. Now let's talk about the sights. Typical German leaf sight, U-notch in the back and a post in the front. At least it's not a barley corn in the front. Adjustable for, adjustable for distance, range of course by just a slider, not windage adjustable. However, while these are serviceable and the German soldiers at the time would have understood this sight picture, it is greatly inferior to the aperture sights of the M1 Garand. And you see that in a lot of guns in Europe. However, aperture sights are objectively superior. And this, while being familiar to the soldier, is not optimal for accuracy. But you'll say, but wait a minute, they have an optics rail and you could put optic on your G43. And that is true. And almost every one of these was manufactured with an optics rail. However, very few of them were issued with it. Out of 400,000 plus of these rifles, somewhere around 50,000 might have been mounted with optics. And the ZF4 optic, it was not easy to acquire for anyone in the field. And the ZF4 optic leaves some things on the table as well, but that's a video for another day. So the iron sights are sufficient. Almost everyone that had a G43 landed up using those iron sights. And the optics rail was nothing more than a cool thing hanging on the side of the gun. Last but not least, the best evidence is this not being a good design was that it was not made or manufactured by any other country after the war. Some of the design elements might have been there, the 10 round detachable magazine, Perhaps, obviously the gas system, which was stolen from the SVT-40, continued on and is still used in some guns today. But this whole flapper locked bolt assembly, exploding spring grenade loaded exploding disassembly, 
parts falling apart in the field, overgassed with safeties flying out and stamped sheet metal dust covers, dust covers, which is, this is really more of a receiver, stamped sheet metal receiver that cracks under fire, um, were not something admirable or anyone looking at after the war was interested in replicating. The U.S. already had the M1 Garin, which was by all objective definition, the superior and best semi-automatic rifle through World War II and for a long time after that, far better than the G43 or the SVT-40 or others of that time. The N-block loading system of the M1 Garand was faster than this stripper clip system, even if it didn't have a detachable magazine. And uh, the locking system was superior, the gas system was superior, the sights are superior. And the fact that this is seen as a really cool gun, which I guess it is from a historical perspective when you think about the difference of design, the rarity of a gun does not necessarily mean that it's better. In fact, more often than not, the rarity of a firearm means that it's problematic and has an issue. There are exceptions. The FG, FG42 is pretty exemplary, but also had problems. However, it did go on to be the M60, and you saw the FG42 continue on in iterations post-war in things like the, M, the, uh, the uh, M60. However, the G43 was a dead-end design, it was a dead end from the beginning. It was a dead end with the G41 when they had the weird bang gas system. Even though they improved it, it was a gun that was designed to fail in the field, self-destruct over only a short duration of rounds fired with bad metallurgy, but beyond the metallurgy, even if that wasn't part of the problem, a bad design. It's just a bad design. That's the truth. And so when you see this turned into legend or lore because of its rarity or because it was used by the bad guys, well, just remember why you're thinking that or why you're being told that. In all truth, it's kind of a piece of junk. Well, hopefully you enjoyed this video or found it at least enlightening. I have used this particular exact rifle, actually, in competitions. Um, I shot them in brutality matches, two gun matches. I have done everything I can do to make this a fireable weapon that I could use over a duration of time. And in fact, I landed up acquiring a G41 milled receiver cover so that I can continue firing the gun safely. That did make a difference. These stamped sheet metal ones, if you have one of these, watch out. No matter what you do with the gas system, you're going to have a problem. But anyways, hopefully you enjoyed this. This is the kind of stuff I can make because of viewers like you supporting the channel via patreon.com slash inrangetv. This stuff isn't going to get large appeal. This is deep firearms nerdery that hopefully you appreciate. Um, it's also, to a large degree, stabbing a sacred cow because rare relics like this that have now command value on the market as collectibles, being told that in use, they're kind of not very good, isn't something everyone wants to hear. But personally, I think that makes it actually more interesting. So thanks for watching. Support us if you can. Subscribe and share with your friends. See you next time.